Hello and welcome. My name is Manu Mishra. You are watching Fluffle Feelings and this is All Things Sane. Episode number one, where I talk about things across the spectrum and I let you be the judge of whether I am I right or wrong after letting you know my honest opinion is disguised as perception. Sounds fun, doesn't it? And let's get straight to it. Today we're going to talk about sports. Two of the favorite sports that I like to follow, football and cricket. And some stories that have been doing the roundabouts in the media for quite some time. So, what better way to kick off this segment with Barcelona. Barcelona have appointed Javi Hernandez as their manager. Now, Barcelona, a team that has been in free fall for some time, has went back to his prodigal son, Xavi Hernandez, who, let's be honest, has been the numero uno choice since Ronald Koeman was sacked and even before Ronald Koeman was appointed. The previous board was hesitant to appoint anybody with a bit of ambition because that would have cost Barcelona something they didn't have. Not just passion, they didn't have money as well. But they hired Ronald Koeman, a former player, a legend of the club, who, let's not forget, in 1992, scored the only goal in the Champions League final to give Barcelona their first ever European crown. Similar to 1999 when Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in Camp Nou scored against Bayern Munich and made Sir Alex Ferguson say those famous words, football, bloody hell. But it's been a while since that happened and football, like the world, has evolved. Ronald Koeman's ancient tactics, or the lack of it, has caused Barcelona to lose games that they shouldn't have lost in any particular condition. Ernesto Valverde has been considered one of the worst Barcelona managers in the history, not just because of what he produced in the Champions League, but his playing style was as boring as it can get. But let's not forget, the man sleepwalked through two La Liga titles in a row, and that is no joke. The 2017-18 season where he won the cup double, the La Liga and the Copa del Rey, that is Barcelona's forte for so many years. In 2019 as well, when Barcelona were dumped out, by Liverpool in the Champions League in May. In April, they clinched their La Liga crown. Something that Lionel Messi always said is going to be difficult when they wouldn't be in the reach for it. Three years down the line, he hasn't been wrong. So, what does Xavi brings to Barcelona? Xavi Hernandez, the former midfield maestro and some people who always call them the greatest midfielder of his generation, would like to watch Barcelona play the similar style of football that Xavi as a player inherited from his ancestors. Footballing ancestors to be precise. But this time around, Xavi Hernandez is in the managerial role where everything falls on him. Good or bad, it will be on Xavi Hernandez, the manager. He won't be finding any scapegoats but will be the one. So, this is not the first case where a former player or a legend has been appointed by a club. Chelsea did in 2019 with Frank Lampard an experiment that has been a result, a mixed pack of results rather. But the youth system was developed very well, but that was partially because they were hit by a transfer ban where UFA said they couldn't sign any more players after the signing of Mateo Kovacic from Real Madrid. Frank Lampard though, developing a very good youth system and integrating them into the Chelsea first team lacked the cutting edge and the ruthlessness that a manager should have. And that cost Chelsea big time. Andrei Shishenko, the living legend of Ukrainian football, took charge of the Ukrainian national team and they did very, very well in the Euros considering what sort of players they had. They didn't have many superstars, they didn't have world beaters, but they had a very good team that played as a unit. But managing a national team and a club is a totally different ball game. When you're managing a national team, you're managing players you know, you're familiar with. When you're managing a club, especially the club like Barcelona, with the stature they have, the history they have, the expectations they have, it is going to be a tough, tough call for Xavi. And although he'll have some really good talents like Ansu Fati, Pedri, Barcelona's new golden boy, Nico, Oscar Mingueza and many others, he will also have to deal with old stalwarts like Sergio Busquets and Gerard Piquet who hasn't been informed and sometimes even Mark Andre Ter Stegen. Will he be able to do that? It remains a mystery to be seen. But until then, me, like every Barcelona fan, would like to wish him all the best because Vizcail Barca, forever Barca. Barcelona was not the only footballing story that did the roundabouts. 
Yesterday, something magical happened. Manchester City travelled to the theatre of dreams with an ambition to win. Well, Pep Guardiola, one of the greatest managers and widely regarded as the greatest manager ever by some, was in charge of a Manchester City side that was rampant and was very much fueled to take the Premier League title back. They didn't want to lose it to Chelsea, they didn't want it to lose to any other rival. Manchester United, on the other hand, has been in free fall since Alex Ferguson left. Although Jose Mourinho, the so-called dinosaur tactician, really gave them three trophies, they have been starved for it ever since he left. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, as I told you earlier, the 1999 hero in Barcelona is the manager now and has been for quite some time. But regarding the initial improvement, he has done something good. But apart from that, he has done what an interim manager could do. He was very good as an interim manager. But the moment he was given the permanent gig, Manchester United's downfall began. They, they just got smashed 5-0 by Liverpool a couple of weeks back. And now Manchester City, even though they only beat them by 2-0, two, two this was a more comfortable scoreline because after the second goal, throughout the second half, they were just playing like a training session. To rub salts into the wounds, they did not make a single substitution. Yes, Pep Guardiola didn't even think about a single substitution against a team like Manchester United. Kind of tells you where they are right now. But the English media, like they always are, are always protecting their mate, their loved one, their beloved Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Let me read you out some of the most interesting things that have been doing the roundabouts in the media about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Manchester United. The Telegraph says, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer expecting upfront and honest talks with Manchester United. Now, what honesty could he show a man who has been clearly out of his depth of a job that is too big for him or too early for him? In either case, the team has been suffering. What sort of honesty can he expect from him? The Evening News says, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer hates at Manchester United major change after Manchester City lost. Now remember, in August, Manchester United defeated Manchester City in the signing of Cristiano Ronaldo, who was unhappy at Turin because he was pinned the main culprit for Juventus' downfall. I don't think they have done good either after his departure, have they? Well, that's not the story. The story is, after making a signing of statement such as that and Rafael Varane from Real Madrid, Manchester United haven't done really, really well. Now... As we talk, they sit 5th in the table, which is not a bad position, just after 11 games, but they are 9 points off top, and they will be having a fight. Brighton, Arsenal and Wolves are in their reach. Teams that under no circumstances should be in the reach of Manchester United, widely considered as one of the most followed clubs on planet Earth. Manchester United are not a club in free fall because of their footballing activities. Manchester United are a club in free fall because they decide that they don't need winners, they don't need a cutthroat manager, a cutthroat policy, they need nice people, they need people who can take the fans in the loop, make them believe through a process, the word which has been doing a lot of rounds in the media, through the fans over the years, and make them believe that Manchester United are on the right path, side by side, also making a lot of money off them. Let's not forget, when they release a new shirt, like every other club, they don't forget to charge 70 odd pounds or 50 odd pounds for an away shirt every season and people buy it in the hope that they'll get to see their beloved team play farewell and win the like league title somewhere near the future. It doesn't look likely anytime soon, has it? So, let me know in the comment section below if you're a Manchester United fan, what do you think about it? And although I don't follow that team much, I was very excited to see the game yesterday. Hence, I switched on the TV and sat through abysmal performances from the team in red barring David Dyer for whom who just is a player that gets disrespected so much that it, if it, it wasn't for him they would have been down by 5-0 or 6-0 by the 70th minute anyways let's move on from football to the sport that I guess a lot of us care about cricket and as I am recording this on a beautiful Sunday evening India's chances of making to the semi-final are slim as they get as slim as they can and it's not looking good but is this the only problem that Indian team has faced this World Cup they knew they had to beat either one Pakistan or New Zealand and if they could beat both then it would have been cherry on the top but we knew it was not going to be easy two top international sides are never a walk in the park especially in a World Cup tournament uh, not so much and India have had the taste of their own medicine why I say this let me take you down the memory lane March 2021 and 
precisely 20th March 2021, India plays the final T20 of the T20 series between India and England in Ahmedabad. And they did a show. They scored 224. Remember, 224 for 2 in 20 overs. A padding masterclass from Virat Kohli and Rohit Sharma, two of India's stalwarts, and a full pack Indian team with Johnny Barristow, the likes of David Milan, Josh Butler, Ben Stokes, Owen Morgan, and Jofra Archer. They could only manage 188. Now, this was a comprehensive win, a win of statement by Team India. Now, why am I referring to this particular game? It's because eight months down the line, we are struggling. We defeated in England in the in the practice game of the World Cup as well, but that hasn't done much good to us either. England have been depleted by two players and two major players in Jofra Archer and Ben Stokes, but they somehow have managed to play as a unit and Oin Morgan, despite his abysmal run of form with the ball, as a captain, has fared spectacularly well and has led his men with charge, affection, care and above all, quality. And they are into the semi-finals and they'll be playing most probably New Zealand come the semi-final of the T20 World Cup. India has had, India has, has been, in, uh, India has been in these situations, I'm sorry. India has been in these situations quite often um, in the past few years, especially in the ICC tournaments. And Virat Kohli has somehow struggled in the latter stages of the tournament. But this time around, he won't be making it to the latter stages, presumably because New Zealand will not be not be surrendering to Afghanistan, a depleted Afghanistan side who lacks confidence and experience of playing big teams in big matches. It isn't the only case uh, that has been so prominent for India. Well, no, let me take you down the memory lane. March 2015, I don't think March suits as much, does it? 26 March 2015, the World Cup semi-final of the World Cup 2015 in Sydney. India plays Australia. Australia bats first and puts up 328 for 7 in 50 overs. A mammoth score, given so, it was scored in a World Cup knockout, adding more pressure. Stephen Smith had a blistering century, but the thing that does a lot of damage was Mitchell Johnson, 27 of 9 deliveries. Remember, he scored a 88, a blistering 88 in the Brisbane Test earlier in December 2014 as well. That made India lose the series, or else India would have tied that series 1-1 after the two test matches in uh, Melbourne and Sydney were drawn. But, was it an unchangeable target? No, it wasn't. India has changed against Australia. Remember the Jaipur run fest in 2013. India has done that. But India here scummed to pressure and Mitchell Johnson once again, proving why he was one of the best bowlers at that time, taking two of India's stalwarts out in Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli. This, this is just to give you a reflection, a, a taste of what India does in pressure games. And although they haven't played a pressure game in this World Cup because they haven't got to the latter stages and they won't presumably, given how the things are going. But when they were playing in Pakistan and New Zealand, they somehow managed to underperform severely. And they are in a situation where they will be playing against Namibia and will be heading straight home. That shouldn't have been the case, but it has been. What does India need? India needs a revamp in its thinking, in its mentality, and although I'm no cricket expert to uh, tell them how should they play on a particular delivery, but it's it's clear to the naked eye they need a fresh set of ideas from the top to the bottom. To when they approach such a game or games like these or tournaments like these, they have a clarity in mind and they can say, okay, we are going to play in a certain way against a certain opposition. Horses for courses has been true yesterday, is true today and will be true forever. There's a reason why Cheteshwar Pujara doesn't play in T20s and Ishan Sharma doesn't get any taste of white ball cricket whatsoever because you want to play your best players or best suited players to a particular format and above all, you should have a clarity and lack of over-dependence on a particular player or particular players like it happened in 2019 when we were so dependent on Rohit Sharma that it took him one game one bad game and that too was against New Zealand and we bowed out of the World Cup like it shouldn't have happened. Anyway, I hope you liked this episode and if you did, do let me know in the comment section. Even if you didn't, do let me know in the comment section as well. Like this video, press the like button, uh, share this video as much as you can, subscribe to the channel for more such content. I'll see you next time around and till then, take care. Cheers.